as much as I love being here, this show, this episode is not about me. This is about the content and the knowledge that I get to share with your audience and what they can gain from it. So it's not a commercial for yourself, not the pitch, not the episode. It's about how you're going to help the host and the audience. Include those topics and I'll wrap it up with here are some recent interviews that my client's done, link to it, and then I attach a one sheet media kit that has all of that in a longer form. That to me is a perfect pitch. And then follow up podcast hosts, it's not their full time job. I follow up about three weeks. Traditional PR and media, it's very fast moving in the news world. So you're following up within two days. And I see publicists do this too, where they'll follow up on a podcast pitch to me within days. I'm like, I have barely read your email. Stop. So give it a few weeks and be polite. The second follow up email I send, I say, This is my last time I will check in. So you know there is an end to all of this. I'm not going to continue harassing you. It's short, it's sweet, and I'm letting you know this is the final time. I'm out. (laughs) Welcome to another episode of Listeners to Leads, where I'm helping podcasters launch and maintain a lead generating show. I'm your host, Alicia Galati, the CEO and head podcast strategist behind Galati Media, a full service podcast management company. On this show, you'll hear my guests and I discuss everything it takes to launch a successful podcast and keep it running. If you're ready to get leads, land speaking gigs, and create deeper connections with your audience through your podcast, then this is the show for you. For today's episode, I have Michelle Glogovac. We're going to be talking all about repurposing your podcast content. She talks about different ways that you can take one podcast episode and share it with your audience intentionally, and that is your podcast or podcasts that you have been a guest on. We also talk about ways to pitch yourself to be on podcasts, so strategic ways to share your message with other podcasters and be able to get that across in a way that doesn't feel like a 30-minute pitch, but also feels like you're giving value to that audience. Definitely listen in where she goes through how many times she follows up with pitches and look for the part where she also shares her journey of entrepreneurship. We have very similar stories, so I had so much fun talking with Michelle today. Hi, Michelle. I am so excited to chat with you today as a fellow podcaster, and we're going to talk about repurposing your content and pitching. Oh my goodness, I feel like we could talk about pitching all day long. But if you could just tell our audience who you are, what you do, a little bit about your podcast, and all that stuff. Yes, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Nothing like two women getting together and chatting all about podcasts. (laughs) I am Michelle Glogovac. I'm the CEO and founder of the MSL Collective, which is a boutique full-service public relations agency specializing in podcasting. And I am the host of the My Simplified Life podcast where I have solo episodes, I share my journey, I share tips on businesses, parenting, everything that I'm learning, but I also have interviews in which everyone has a career story, which I think we'll talk about ours today too, but there's been some sort of a pivot or switch along the way. I found that with every single person I've talked to. And so we talk about their story, tips that they can offer now, and the whole premise is that you get to decide what your future is. It doesn't matter what your past was. It doesn't matter what your present is. You get to make changes to decide what your future holds for you. So that is my message on my show and what we talk about every single week. In your bio, you said that you had a career in aviation, which I'm like, oh my goodness, what does that mean? What is that? Tell me all about it. (laughs) So ever since I was five, I wanted to be an attorney. I was dead set on being an attorney, and my major in college was law. I went to UC Santa Barbara, and I needed a part-time job because college is expensive, and I was rowing on the crew team, and that was more money. So I found that the corporate aviation side was hiring for customer service reps, and I could walk to work. It was along the beach. It was beautiful. So I started as customer service quickly. Within three months, they lost their bookkeeper at the base. So suddenly I was the bookkeeper, HR, customer service manager, and I was meeting celebrities. And it was awesome. It was incredible. 
And when I graduated college, they put me on salary and gave me benefits. And I'm like, oh, I don't have to go back home to my mom. I'm going to stay here. And it became my career. I continued on with working for two Fortune 100s and I moved across the country for work. I got to travel around the country. It was great because I loved the people that I worked with, but I sold jet fuel. I was business development, marketing. It was all about jet fuel. And that's really not a sexy topic. Jets, yes, those are awesome. You know, I could watch them all day long, but you're like, jet fuel, eh. I got the thrill out of going, oh, you need 250 gallons? Why don't you make it 500 and I'll give you 10 cents off? That's what excited me. (laughs) Goals. It's all about goals and reaching them. So when I had my first child in 2015, I took two weeks of maternity leave, which is absolutely nuts, but we didn't have any sort of a policy. I was like, well, I can do it, even though I had a C-section. And my boss at the time, who was a female and a mother, I'm like, she's going to get it. She's going to get it. And she said, you don't have to travel for six months. My son was 10 days old when I got the phone call of, you should go to New York next week and just bring your kid with you. The receptionist, wherever you're going, can watch him. I was like, you're out of your mind. I was crying on the floor in my bedroom. And my husband goes, you got to quit. You got to find something else. By then, I was pregnant with my second child. Oops. I found another job, which was much more conducive to being a working mom from home. I worked from home already for many, many years. But then I was laid off in 2018. And my husband's also in aviation. We'd been traveling to the same places. We took a nanny. We had two babies. It wasn't like when you're single in your 20s and can do all these things. It was like, okay, I'm going to be at a conference all day. Now I get to go to my hotel room and feed two kids and put them to bed. There was something else out there for me. And I was laid off and I said, I'm not going back to aviation. I need to find something else. And a woman from my birthing class added me to a Facebook group with a life and business coach who was launching her podcast. And I went, oh, a podcast? September of 2018, I found the purple button on my iPhone and listened to my first podcast even though they've been around for 20 years. (laughs) I started listening to her and I was jazzed at, I'm going to find something that I'm meant to do. And I'm so excited about it. And she actually ended up reaching out to me to pitch her to be on podcasts. I then got so involved with her and her business that I produced her show. And then it was just like a trickle effect of producing more shows, pitching people. And then I said, well, if I'm promoting everyone in their voice, maybe I should promote my own voice. And so I launched my podcast as well in 2019. Going from pitching, I I decided I liked the pitching part more than the producing part because it's a lot more time consuming last minute wise. I'm not a big fan of last minute, but at Monday at 8 p.m. you're getting the email of, oh, I forgot to send you my podcast that should go live at 5 (laughs) a.m. Yes. That's not what being a business owner is about to me. I wanted that freedom and flexibility. I pivoted completely to the pitching side. My clients were like, you're getting us on these great shows. What else can you do for us? Where else can you put us? And so last year, I added traditional public relations, pitching to, you know, traditional media, TV, digital outlets, that sort of a thing. And I absolutely love it. I've been very successful in it. You know, it all comes down to relationships. And I think that's no matter what business you're in, it's about relationships. In aviation, I was in sales. That's a relationship-based business. I just moved that over to the podcasting and PR side. When I was trying to figure out what kind of business I wanted to have with podcasting, I was like, you know, I can pitch. Sure, that's fine. I know I've pitched myself to plenty. I'm at the point now where I actually can't pitch myself anymore because I get too many people reaching out to have me on their summits or their shows or their podcasts. And so I've minimized myself to only two a month. And then I direct them to another woman of color who is a podcast producer. Like, hey, go to this person. She's fantastic. I like her. Go. (laughs) But in the beginning, when I was like shifting my business after also being laid off and being like, okay, I'm going to do this thing. It's going to be great. Pitched myself to a ton. Got a ton of acceptances. Two things. Tried to offer it also as a service. And I had two clients and we had like a three month contract going where I would pitch them to podcasts. And I found, and I, I love your version of the last minute podcast production things because those totally happen. (laughs) Hey, this episode is supposed to go live on Wednesday. I know it's Sunday, but you know, here you go. Like like we don't have like 15 clients at the moment to manage, you know what I mean? (laughs) But it happens. 
trying to do podcast pitching, that was one thing where I'm very type A, I have to be in control of certain things. And when I can't control the outcome, then that's where I'm like, yeah, no, not interested. I'm not going to spend my time on something that I can't control. How do you feel about that? And how are you able to like, I guess, push past that? Or are you just not type A like me? (laughs) I am type A, but I'm also very much a people person. I love getting to know people. It's a great way for me to find out about other shows, meet other people. Majority are all women because my clients, the roster's all women. So I'm pitching them to, you know, female podcasters. And there's this network that I'm getting to grow and get to know other people. So that for me is what I love. Going back to the aviation stuff where I'm upselling, you know, on gallons and getting a thrill out of. I remember the first year they implemented um, in my sales job of actually having goals. And your goal is to sell X amount this year. And I was like, whatever, I'm going to double that. And I did. For me, there's something that I'm very competitive, even just with myself. And I'm like, no, I'm going to get you on this show. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get bigger and better and continue doing that. So it's more for me that I'm goal oriented and I'm going to keep trying. And I think one of the big things in podcast pitching is the follow up. What I love to remind people is most podcasters, this isn't your full time job. My podcast is not my full-time job. I'm not sitting here waiting for a guest to pitch themselves to me and then respond right away. You know, of course, if I know who you are or I know the agency, then yeah, your email is going to get responded to much quicker. But if your pitch is horrible, (laughs) right now I'm batching all of my content for the entire summer, three months. I'm not going, oh, I want a guest. I need a guest. There's an email, but it's in the follow up of, hey, did you see this? I just want to make sure, you know, I'm following up and doing it politely. That's when you're getting the attention. And oftentimes it'll be on my second follow up, which is my third email, that the host goes, oh, I'm so glad you followed up because I've been meaning to get to your email and it blanked my mind. So it's really in that follow up that you find the success. And I think a lot of people just give up after the first email. But sales is seven touches. So the fact that I'm only doing three and still successful, then that says a lot. My career was never in sales. It was more in the production side of things. And so we didn't like sales because sales would always (laughs) promise certain things. Customer service would promise certain things. And then production would be like, you guys know we can't do that, right? Like that's, That's not possible. We can't put And we were in in compressed gases. So it's like, we can't put this gas in this size cylinder. It will blow up. Like, what is wrong with you? You know, things like (laughs) that. Where they're like, nope, we're going to sell it. We're going to reach our goals. Woohoo! So I totally understand where your take is like, you already have that mindset of one, reaching your goals and being able to hit those things. And that's kind of like when we launch a podcast, we only take on full service launches because we want to be able to control all the aspects of it so that we can make sure that it hits certain charts that they're able to see success depending on what their level of quote unquote success looks like, but being able to ensure all of those things by handling all the different aspects. So I totally understand that. Like, this is our goal. Let's hit it, (laughs) you know, but that seven touch point, I remember learning about that in one of my degrees somewhere, (laughs) you know, one of those online classes I had to take, like being able to push that into pitching yourself. What is a good pitch look like and sound like? There's obviously different ways you can do it. Emails, filling out forms. People send video memos via Instagram or voice memos or even pitch via DMs. And literally the list could go on on ways to connect with podcasters. So what do you recommend that people at least start with? So I want to hit on something first that you mentioned about what you do with your clients and full service. Because when my clients come on board with me to be pitching clients, I create their topics for them. I stalk the living daylights out of them and get to know them. And then we strategize together when I go, here's what I think you can speak on. Tell me yes or no. Let's tweak these topics. And there are some agencies that don't. I just found out last week that one of the largest podcast pitching agencies says, come on board, bring your bio, bring your topics, and then we'll make it pretty and and send it out. That's not high touch. How do you have control over getting booked if you're not actually in control of some of the content that you're sending out? To your point, that's how I reach those goals is by having input into what are the topics that you're going to speak on and how does this all come together in a framework? When we go to pitch, to me, a good pitch is you do not give the host homework 
first and foremost. Include links, include your website link, include social media links, include links to your previous interviews if you've been on them. If you haven't, don't worry about it because you will get one or two under your belt and then you can include those. Here's one I got last week. I've seen your recent guests. You haven't seen anything because you you have to listen to my show. So there's mistake number one. And who are these recent guests? Listen to an episode or two. It doesn't take long. And don't make it the most recent one. I really have heartburn when someone mentions just the most recent one. Unless that's truly the one you connected with, scroll a bit. See what else they've produced. And you want to make sure it's not something that they've already covered too. But listen to it. Connect with them. Read the description. Make sure they take guests. Otherwise, you look silly. When I relate to the host, I always personalize it. Nothing's copy and pasted except for the topics, which get switched up. Out of six, I'll include three, depending on what's most applicable. But I relate to the host and say, here's what I loved about this episode, and here's why. Whether it's because my client is very similar, has similar beliefs, or it's me. Oftentimes, I just relate to them oh, you said this about being a working mom and I totally get that and here's my story and I'll tell them about myself. I had one host who, when I read her entire website, I'm like, oh my gosh, she and I are like soul sisters. She loves wine. Her husband drinks whiskey. She's got Irish twins. She's a podcast host. I'm like, this is me. And that's what I told her. And she goes, that was the best pitch I've ever gotten. She invited me on and I wasn't even pitching myself. (laughs) So personalize it, you know, really get to know the host, get to know the show, relate to it. And then I'll include a little blurb about my client, not the full bio, but a couple sentences of this is who my client is and what she does, and then how she's going to relate to your audience, because it's about the audience and the host. It is not about you. As much as I love being here, this show, this episode is not about me. This is about the content and the knowledge that I get to share with your audience and what they can gain from it. So it's not a commercial for yourself, not the pitch, not the episode. It's about how you're going to help the host and the audience. Include those topics and I'll wrap it up with here are some recent interviews that my client's done, link to it, and then I attach a one sheet media kit that has all of that in a longer form. That to me is a perfect pitch. And then follow up, podcast hosts, it's not their full-time job. I follow up about three weeks. Traditional PR and media, it's very fast moving in the news world. So you're following up within two days. And I see publicists do this too, where they'll follow up on a podcast pitch to me within days. I'm like, I have barely read your email. Stop. So give it a few weeks and be polite. The second follow-up email I send, I say, this is my last time I will check in. So you know there is an end to all of this. I'm not going to continue harassing you. It's short, it's sweet, and I'm letting you know, this is the final time. I'm out. (laughs) You put your heart and your soul into your show. And I want to help you reach all of those potential listeners out there. That's why I'm excited to announce my upcoming podcast marketing workshop. It's about giving you practical tools to grow your audience. You'll learn the secrets to getting your podcast discovered, attracting your dream listeners, and boosting those download numbers. This workshop will be hosted live with a replay available on April 30th. You can sign up by going to galatimedia.com slash workshop. Let's grow our podcasts together. I cannot tell you the amount of times that I've gotten just even, hey, we'd love to work with your business random pitches from maybe they found me on Instagram, they like what I do, and they want to try to sell me their their business, right? But they'll send an email and then within a few days, they'll reply to that email and say, hey, did you see this? And I'm like, no, I sent you to spam. (laughs) Or I just wanted to make sure this got in your inbox. It did. The best follow-up I've gotten is from an agency, and apparently this is how they train because I've gotten it from multiple people within their agency, is the word Bing, B-I-N-G with an exclamation point. That's all the email follow-up said. That's not a follow-up. It's not an email. That's a sound that your phone makes when you have something coming in. No. I appreciate it for the fact that I can use it as a bad example, but it's just a no.
I remember the first time in corporate, I had just switched to a different company. And I've only had like two or three companies that I've worked for in my career. The one I was with for like seven years. So quite a long time with them. I think it was my boss. He was like, bang it over to me. And I was like, what the heck does that mean? Like, what? I'm guessing you mean send? Is this what older people say? Like, when they're trying to send an email? (laughs) I'm a millennial. So like, (laughs) he was maybe like in his like later 40s. (laughs) I was just like, what is happening here? What does this mean? But that is hilarious that that's the only thing they said. Like, did you see this? Like, maybe you should be using the proper stuff so that you know that I saw it and then you can determine whether you want to follow up. So when your clients are on their podcast interviews, how do you recommend they do promote themselves? Because obviously you want to connect with the audience, you want to be able to share your awesomeness, and then kind of get something from that interview to kind of take forward, whether that's you know, hey, listen to my podcast or anything like that. But like, what do you recommend that your clients do in that connect with me phase? Well, I let them all know that at the end of every show, every interview I've ever done, the host always says, can you tell everyone where they can find you? So that's your time where you can promote where they can find you. But really, if you're offering up all of your knowledge and you're just blowing people away, they're going to want to seek and find you anyway. So you don't need to come on and say, oh, I've got this course and my course is awesome. And, you know, you should join my course and join my program and do this. It's not a commercial. You know, this is really a time for you to share a lesson and share your expertise. When you show how much you know, they're going to want to come and find you and work with you and buy whatever it is that you have. That's definitely where you're going to get the most bang for your buck just by sharing your knowledge and doing it freely. Like I said to you before we started this, I want people to know how to pitch themselves properly, yet it's some secret sauce that not everybody knows. You know, in in the PR world, publicists who have been around for 20, 30 years, I've had them actually come to me and say, I don't know how to pitch a podcast because it's so completely different from pitching media. I don't want it to be a secret. You know, there's enough for all of us to go around. There's an abundance of publicists. There's more and more podcast pitchers. What it comes down to is your relationship, how you can relate, how you can personalize a pitch. That's really what it's going to come down to in the end. So whether or not I tell you this is the framework, you still have to do the actual work. So I don't have to be scared of losing business. You don't have to be scared, you know, in starting your business. Here's the framework. Now make it unique in your own. I recently was having a chat with my biz bestie. She's like, Alicia, I want to do this freebie and I want to do this thing and I want to do this other thing and I want to have a membership, but I like doing one-on-one services. I was like, listen, (laughs) like you got to decide what you want to do. Do you want to be a membership creator? Do you want to be a course creator? Do you want to do one-on-one services? I personally do not promote my freebie anymore on my website because I want one-to-one services. So all of my free content is via my podcast, via social media, and via doing some type of guest interviewing or showing up in other places. And she was kind of going through her customer journey and she had shared her screen with me. And I'm like, okay, your podcast is doing the first two things. (laughs) Like it's taking your customer from, oh, wow, this is really interesting. I never thought of that. How do I work with you? How do I spend money with you? Your free content is already doing that. You don't need a freebie to get people. But giving value, giving of just your time, your effort, and not holding back because you've got some quote unquote secret sauce. Like, no, that's the implementation, the working with me, being able to send me an email and say, okay, I had this quick question about sponsors, you know, that kind of stuff. When it comes to just being able to show up for your audience, free content all the way everywhere totally with it, like 100%. I think there's a mixed message that we keep getting as female entrepreneurs in the online space of we have to have all of these things. And when you're just coming in, it's really confusing. I'm in the middle of one book that everyone and their mother is currently reading. Last night, I read a part where she says, you know, you can be multi-passionate, but you can only have one source of income. But if you take a few steps back and look at the author, she has a online shop. She has a membership. She has a book. She has all of these things coaching. I'm like, you're not practicing what you're preaching. But is anyone else who's reading this actually looking at it the same way? No, because they're all joining your membership right now 
We all just need to stop. Yeah. Focus. You don't have to do all the things one thing at a time and do it good. It's really about what you want your business to look like. At the end of last year, I had a choice between two programs that I was looking to invest in. One was going to teach me how to sell my high ticket offer and to then have one high ticket offer and then have a lower ticket course. And so they kind of funnel each other into each other, which is a great strategy. The other one was how to build a business around one-on-one service, have contractors, have people working under you, having, you know, multiple six-figure business, but with a team. And I was like, do I want to be able to serve a group of people or do I want to build my audience and grow my audience and do that in order to funnel the courses and the hot one-to-one services? And like, what do I want my business to look like? And take time to really think about that and then say, I want to look like that person. This is the person that I want to be in a year. So that's the program that I'm going to join. But I think we get so caught up in following everybody else's framework (laughs) that sometimes we forget about what it is that we actually want out of our business. And this is a conversation. It's taking like a whole left turn here. (laughs) (laughs) But it's true. I think especially when you come into the online space from the corporate world, it's so different. There's so much to consume content wise. I think it's important to take a step back as you are consuming all of this, taking the pieces that work for you, but leaving the rest to the side. So let's funnel back, (laughs) move our way back into the podcast content. So how do you repurpose your content and tell your clients to repurpose their content to really optimize them and make the most out of them? I actually created a course on this on how to repurpose your podcast content. And I identified 17 different ways that you can repurpose one episode. It goes from you've got your Instagram post, you've got a story, you can do a reel, you can do your highlights, you can do Twitter and LinkedIn and Pinterest and TikTok. And there's so many different ways that you can repurpose an interview that it's ridiculous. You can create a process for it. So it's really becomes plug and play. When you're not the host, when you're the guest, you can do something similar. Listen to the episode, have a VA listen to it. I like to have my intern actually listen to my episodes or my interviews because oftentimes she'll catch something that I haven't. Grab your own quotes, you know, make quote graphics out of it so you become the thought leader and you're promoting yourself and your knowledge. Share, sharing your interview, not just on Instagram in a story, that's a no-no. Don't just do it on the story for 24 hours and then poof, it's gone. I think it's rude. It's not being thankful at all. I've had one person say, well, their aesthetic didn't fit my aesthetic when it comes to the graphics. Well, you know what? Create a carousel on your Instagram posts so that your aesthetic is the first one. And then the actual graphic for the podcast is the second one. And They're going to swipe through it, which is going to promote your engagement. So it's a win-win. Don't use the excuse of that. I think you need to have a media page. I've got one where every interview I've ever been on is listed and it's linked to the actual episode. Use Pinterest. Pinterest used to be, oh, recipes and my house and how pretty it's going to look. No, entrepreneurs are all over it. So share your interviews there. Promote yourself. LinkedIn is a great platform as well. Twitter. Nobody's on Twitter except for PR and journalists, it seems right now. I'm on Twitter every single day and it is incredible. The connections I've made are fantastic. You know, promote yourself there. Just share it everywhere that you can think of to share it. It's great for the host. They appreciate it. Tag them. And you're promoting yourself as that thought leader and the expert on whatever topic you just spoke on. Do both of those as the guest and as the host, you know, create templates for your graphics. So you just change out the headshot, change out the title, the episode number, and you can put it everywhere. Those are my biggest tips for repurposing because so often you get people, I'm sure you get this all the time. How do I market my show? How come I don't have more listeners? You know, it's only on download on Apple. And this is what, where are you promoting it? Once a week in one spot, you can actually create Instagram content because I know this is a big thing of, I don't know what to post today. Go back a year ago and what were you talking on? Reference back to that one because even though it might seem like we're repeating it for ourselves, we're not for our followers. 
they've forgotten. They didn't read it because it didn't populate in their feed most recently. Put it out there again. You know, you can reference back. I'll go, hey, did you see on episode one where I talked about my career switch? Probably not because I'm on episode 87 right now. You know, go back, reference it, link it, make sure it's on website. Show notes, so important to put on your website to bring traffic back to you, you know, embed your player. It's just, it's so simple. And yet so many don't understand that because podcasts are listening. Whereas if you have show notes, now you have SEO capabilities where you're becoming more searchable. Take all of that into consideration and that's how you can link back to it. That's how you drive traffic to Pinterest to your website is by having your show notes and then having the pin go to your website with the show notes and, oh, there's a player right there. I can play it right from your website. I had one guest actually ask me if she could get one, the download for her episode. So like once it's published, can she get the download? Because she shares it with her clients to show them different strategies and things that she does. And then it still shows up on my downloads as someone downloaded it using that link. So sure, why not? (laughs) And then also mentioned the embed player that she would love to put that on her website in her media kit. And I'm like, that is brilliant. Like, (laughs) I've never thought of that. Like, asking the host, hey, can I grab the embed player for that episode I was on? I would love to share it on my blog. Like you said, I don't think people and podcasters realize how much traffic they can get through Pinterest. It is insane. (laughs) Grab yourself a tailwind and keep it moving. Like just do that. It's so good. And it drives so much traffic and it's untapped for sure. And Twitter, oh man, Twitter scares me. (laughs) I am terrified of Twitter. I look at it and I'm like, I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> what is your suggestion for a quick tweet of, hey, I was on this show. Here's the link. Well, you know, they still use hashtags. Whatever you're speaking on or your expertise is, put that in there. Tag the host. And it doesn't have to be long, you know, short enough. And add the link. For my podcast, I have it automatically tweeting out when it goes live. Same thing with YouTube. It uploads automatically. It's a beautiful, easy function when you're a podcaster that all of these things are linked together. And when you're a guest, take a quote from yourself. Quote yourself. It is okay to quote yourself. I just want to put that out there because I think even for me, I was for the longest time, I'd have every other Instagram post be a quote from someone. Michelle Obama said this and Oprah said this. And then I'm like, wait, I just said something really good too last week. I can quote myself. So now the only quotes you're seeing on my feed are of myself from podcasts. So quote yourself. It's totally okay. Promote yourself. That is all right. That's one thing that we do with our clients that we do graphics for. We give them quotables that have their quote and the guest quote so that they can share both what they said that was genius during that episode as well as what the guest said that was really good. So I 100%, 100% agree. So good. You covered so much. There were so many things in here that I feel like people can take away and use and implement. And as I say, uh, practically every episode, take one or two things, then come back and listen as you've implemented those. If you're looking for more strategies, but just take one or two things to do this week. Don't overwhelm yourself. You don't have to do it all. Now, if you have a team of people helping you, then sure, do it all. (laughs) But if it's just you, remember, podcasting is a slow burn. And I think a lot of people are like, I've had my podcast for a month. Why don't I have 10,000 downloads? It doesn't really happen like that. So take it one step at a time, one day at a time, keep doing the best you can. Michelle, if you could tell us where to get that course for repurposing, I think that would be a fantastic start for people as well as where to find you and your podcast. Yes, thank you. And included in the course, which goes right along with what you said about podcasting, is my podcast process. I think it's really important as you start and you launch, take the time to write down every step that you take to create an episode. Because then when you are ready to hire someone, you can just hand it all off and it's done exactly the way you want. Step by step, make it dummy proof. So you can find the course. It's called Repurpose Your Podcast Content. On my website, themslcollective.com, you can also find all of my services for PR, podcast pitching, all that stuff. My Simplified Life is the podcast. I'm always on Instagram, Michelle Glogovac. You can find me on Twitter too, Mick Glogovac. And I'm on all of the other platforms, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Facebook. So I'm everywhere. (laughs) Awesome. And we'll make sure that 
We have those links in the show notes. So if you're like driving or you're not sure where to find those, then you can definitely find those over there. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being on. It was ah covered so much goodness. Thank you. It's a topic I love talking about. Everybody go check her out. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Listeners to Leads. If you found something in this episode valuable, I would really appreciate it if you shared it with a friend who you know would also get value from it. Want to send me a message? My favorite place to hang out is Instagram. You can find me at alicia.lotti. Let me know what your favorite takeaway was from the episode. And don't forget, turning those listeners into leads is actually easy.